This morning, I'm reading to you all from Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what more? It's the third day since this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. <coughs> As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. Thank you. That was perfect. Um, <clears throat> it's good to have a big chunk of scripture, isn't it? Last time I preached, though, it was only about three verses and I still went on and on for ages. <laughs> so um, I thought I'd start with a joke. That's the convention of preaching. You have to start with some levity to warm up the crowd. <laughs> so these are some jokes that I got off a website. The website is run by a man who, who actually moderates a children's jokes website. Um, but he has received submissions from actual children with jokes that they've made up. And they are not good. <laughs> Here are some. Two madmen are in Paris. And one asks... What are we going to do? And the other responds, jump into the sea. That's the end. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Salad man. Salad man, who? Salad man is cold outside and he needs a jacket. <laughs> it's pretty nice, isn't it? How many sharks does it take to make a grandpa shark? 1,280,000 sharks. That's all it takes. Easy. <laughs> I am a business shoe. You're not a business shoe, you were just a regular shoe looking for a job. 
<laughs> they don't get any better, do they? A man goes to a doctor's office and says, Doctor, I'm a chicken. And the doctor says, no, you're not. That's it. <laughs> That's my final one. You can stop laughing after this. Uh, I think you might be able to see who wrote this. What is my sister and her friends? Stupid. <laughs> There's a disgruntled little boy there somewhere. <coughs> so, why did I read a load of inane jokes? Um, we, the reason I think those are so funny is because you can see that there's a child in there trying to get a laugh, aren't they? They're trying, they've understood comedy, laughter, that's good, it brings us together. I want to be part of the crowd, part of the joke. I'm going to start making up jokes. But unfortunately, they haven't yet developed the sort of nuance, the comedic timing, the sense of the absurd, um, which you need to sort of be good at jokes. And some would say, neither have I. Um, <laughs> and in a way, the tenuous link here is that if we don't have a proper understanding of the resurrection, okay, we're the same. We're missing the point. Okay, we haven't got the punchline. Um, we can know the story. And in fact, we've just come through the Easter season. We're still in it, really. Um, but the Tesco is full of chocolate eggs and all the other supermarkets too. Other supermarkets are available. Um, and people are talking about it, Easter, Easter, Easter. So few people understand it, you know? They are getting, half, they're getting halfway there, okay? And they don't understand the, the crux, um, which is the important part, you know? And it's, it's like a bad joke, isn't it? It's without a punchline. You, you just, it's not, it's not landing. Um, so today, that's what we're going to do, is just walk through the meaning of the resurrection, why it's important, why it's valid, why it's life-changing. Um, and we're going to use this passage from Luke. And I'm going to break it down into three parts, and each part will be very short and very easy to swallow. <laughs> um, <laughs> The first one is the truth of the resurrection, okay? Is it true? The second thing is, is it necessary, the need of the resurrection, okay? And then finally, the relationship of the resurrection, or the relationship the resurrection affords us in Christ, okay? So we'll get through that together. Come on. The truth of the resurrection. Does it need to be true? Yes. Oh, that was a very muted response. <laughs> God's people. Um, does it need to be true? Yes, it does need to be true. The Bible is full of allegory, isn't it? There's lots of stories and uh, metaphors. Uh, is this story one of them? No, it is not. Okay, it's a factual account. All right? If you read the account of a woman from the Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, you will know what an allegory is. Okay? Uh, but in this story, it's a factual account. All right? How do we know that? Firstly, Luke wrote it. And he's a bit of a facts nerd. He loves to write factual accounts. Uh, he wrote Acts as well. Um, so he is writing in a style which says, this is an, an encounter that actually happened. Okay, this, this walk on the road to Emmaus is a real thing. Um, <coughs> um, so, so it's not just another nice story. Okay, The resurrection is not just, oh, a, a good guy died, and then his sort of spirit lives on in us. And that's the kind of misunderstanding of the resurrection, which I think a lot of people outside of church have. Okay? The resurrection is a real thing that really happened to a real person. That person is still alive today. His name is Jesus. Okay? And so Luke offers us a certain amount of proof. Okay? Um, what is this proof? Okay, he uses three stories in this passage, not, not just the one we read. This is one of the stories, but in the... Luke 24, he uses three stories. The women in the garden, this encounter on the road to Emmaus, and um, his appearing before the disciples. Okay? Um, why does he use these three? Well, I think, I think that's the key. That's one of the keys for the veracity of the story. Okay? So let's imagine this. Okay? You are launching a, a new religion or a political party or a campaign. Okay? How are you going to do it? You're going to use fanfare, aren't you? You're going to try and get some groundswell, get some people excited. What you're going to do is, is to try and create a buzz, okay? And these, these stories that we're reading now, these encounters at the end of Luke, are the buzz of the early church, okay? This is the, the movie trailer of the beginning of Christianity, all right? Jesus is returned. He's alive, 
Okay? How would a human have done it? It would have been big, wouldn't it? That's how he would have done it. Jesus is back. Mark 2. You know, it would have been big, all right? We would have expected explosions and blinding light. But that's not the way that God does it, okay? And this story, is, it, it, it's, its honesty and its humility is evidence of its truthfulness, isn't it? Because no one would have written a story like this to try and launch a new religion, okay? People wouldn't have laid down their lives for a story so humble unless it was real, unless it was true, okay? So that's one of the things that Luke tries to get across to us, all right? The other thing is he uses names, okay? Um, he uses the name Cleopas. So if you were writing a fictional account of two men walking down a road, chatting to a stranger, you would probably give them both a name, wouldn't you? You would say, Bob and Jane are walking down the road, okay? Has Luke just run out of names for his fictional story? No, he uses a name, and that's intentional, because that is a historical way. At that time, people could have gone and checked the facts, okay? He said Cleopas because Cleopas was part of the community to which he was sharing this message. And so they could go to Cleopas and say, hey, Cleopas, what's this Luke's banging on about? And he would have said, oh, no, that's accurate. Yeah, I did do that. Okay, so he uses a name so that you can go and check the sources. Okay, obviously we can't do that, but it's a sign to us, however many thousands of years on, that this was a real encounter and a real event, okay? There's more to it, <coughs> okay? As I said, this is them launching the church. This is the beginning of a new thing, all right? If you're launching a political campaign, what do you say of the leaders of your campaign? They are the best. They are the most intelligent. They are the most wonderful. They're going to save the day, okay? People try and criticize your, your chosen sort of figurehead, and you shut them up. You say, shut up, shut up, you're wrong. You're bigoted, you're biased. Okay, our guy's the best. But actually, what do we see in the Bible? All the stories of the gospel are of the ineptitude of the disciples. Okay, they are arrogant, they are proud, they are selfish. They fail time and time again. They let Jesus down in the most horrendous ways in his moments of need. They are gone. Uh, but these are the guys who are now the heads of the church. Okay, these are the guys who are turning up to church every Sunday saying, oh, let's talk about the time that I really screwed up again. You know, that's, that is the gospel message is the, the inane disciples who then are now leading this incredible revolution, you know, going on about how much they messed up. And humans wouldn't do that, would we? That's not how we'd start things off. That's not how we'd kickstart a new religion by just banging on about how our leaders messed up and messed up and messed up. But that's what happened. It's truthful, okay? And this is one of those ways, you know, these, these, these guys, these early church leaders, Cleopas probably was a leader. Um, you know, this is an encounter of him coming across the resurrected Christ and not even recognizing him. And then Christ criticizing him and saying, you idiot, you didn't get it right, you've missed the point. You know, this isn't the way to start, is it? This isn't the way a human being would start things. So it's truthful, it's honest. There's, there's loads and loads of evidence, but this is just the three little ones that stuck out to me. So the resurrection is true, the truth. Let's move on to the next bit. Why do we need it? Okay, why do we need the resurrection? The passage says Cleopas and his friends were downcast. The Message Bible says long-faced like they had lost a best friend. Anyone who's lost a loved one can relate to that experience, can't they? You know, we all lost someone. You know, and that sense of despair. So, like the early on, that sense of just, oh, I'm never going to see them again. You know, anyone can and can imagine that feeling of being in that place. Just the injustice and the unfairness of it. And then a stranger comes up to them on the road and says, "Hey guys, what's the?" Why the long face? That's a crazy thing to say, isn't it? And the disciples, well, Cleopas and his buddy, they'd be forgiven for being a bit short at this moment. Being like, can you not see we're sad? Go away. Stop bothering us. We're sulking right now. And in fact, their reaction is a little bit like that, isn't it? Because they say like, what are you on about? Are you, are you not from around here? 
Have you not heard what's going on? Like, you must be a complete foreigner to not pick up on the news. Everyone's talking about it. Okay, that's how big the, Christi- the crucifixion was. It wasn't a small deal. You know, it wasn't just a few hundred fringe weirdos on the edge of town. It was the talk of the town. Everybody knew about it. You'd have to be a complete alien to be walking in, or in and around Jerusalem at this time and not have heard of the crucifixion. So that's how they respond. They say, have you not heard about this? It's big news. Later on in the Bible, uh, in Acts, Paul goes before a pagan governor called Festus and the leader of the Jewish people of the time called King Agrippa. Uh, he's defending himself in front of them in a, like a legal case and he gives his testimony. Um, and this is further evidence for just how big a deal the crucifixion was and how real it was, okay? So Paul is giving his defense. He gives his testimony of his conversion on the road to Damascus, and he concludes with this from Acts 26. I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and, the f- and as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people, and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. And then Paul says, I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king, meaning Agrippa, the other guy who was up there, is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Okay, so the death and the resurrection of Christ was as real to the church as it was to the enemies of the faith, okay? King Agrippa was not a goodie, right? He was a baddie. But even he couldn't deny what, was, what had been going on in that time. And even years later, Paul could bring it up in front of him and say, a King Agrippa, you know what we're talking about here. And in the passage after that, King Agrippa, he doesn't really say much. He just sort of makes a joke. Um, and then they kind of move on. <coughs> but... You know, everyone was aware of the resurrection. So th- the response of Cleopas and his friend is fair enough, all right? It was familiar enough to everyone at the time. So everyone would know why Cleopas and his friend were sad. And, and, and everyone would understand why they were amazed at Jesus' question. Like, why are you guys so sad? Obviously we're sad. So they're sad because they lost a friend. But actually, it goes beyond that for these guys, okay? Um, in the passage, it says, he was a, uh, the Cleopas is talking here. He says, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Okay, that's like an obituary, isn't it, of Jesus? And if you were hearing that, a great man in word and deed. He'd be like, yeah, I was pretty great. You know, it would be a good obituary to hear that from someone. Someone said that about me when I was dead. I'd be chuffed. Um, <coughs> great in word and deed. How did Jesus respond to their sadness? How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Next time you see someone mourning, you should go up to them and be like, you idiot. <laughs> It's not fun, is it? It's not cool. You know, this is more like, why would, they, why would they have written this story this way? You know, Jesus is so critical of them. Why is he critical? And it understand, it's for us now, this is the, learn, this is the lesson, okay? Um, this is why Luke included one of the, this, this account in his gospel, because it shows us a meaningful way that we can connect with Christ, okay? A meaningful way that our hearts can be set on fire like those disciples were, all right? Because Cleopas' answer reveals uh, his understanding or misunderstanding of the resurrection, okay? Because what he said is, he was a great man, he was going to redeem us, and when, when he's talking about redemption, he's talking about the redemption from the Roman Empire, okay? So what he was saying is, he was going to redeem us from our circumstances, all right? He was going to take our lives and make them better in a circumstantial way. He was going to take us from oppression, economic oppression, political oppression. We'd see the Romans cast down, their empire overthrown. We wouldn't be subjected to their rule and authority. Okay? And that is what winds Jesus up. 
Because he's missed the point, all right? There is a deeper reason, a deeper bondage, a deeper slavery, which Jesus came to rescue them from, which they have not understood, all right? And so his reaction is, oh, I died for this. You haven't got it yet. He, didn't, he wasn't reacting like that. He's Jesus. Um, that's how I would have reacted. <laughs> because up until the resurrection, true freedom from sin was unattainable. All right? Sin could be atoned for through sacrifices, but the law kept God's people in chains. All right? and, and, and this is what Jesus does. He how does he get them to understand the resurrection? Uh, he opens the scriptures. Okay? And that's why Luke includes it. Because he's giving us a lesson. Okay? This is how we access an understanding of the resurrection of Christ. Through the scriptures. Okay? He, so what Jesus did is he offered them a key. All right? To unlocking the word of God. Okay? Or eyeglasses to perceive the story behind the story all right because up until that point the people of Israel had been reading the scriptures from a moralistic standpoint okay so they had been taking each story at face value trying to pull a moral message from it and then apply that to their lives and that is what the trap that we fall into as well okay David and Goliath David was young he was weak he brought down the strong the proud of will be made humble. Something like that. Cool, let's move on. All right? This is not what Jesus was doing. As he walked on the road with them, he said, look, David selected because he was the weakest of his brothers, because he was the least, was selected and stood in front of the army of Israel as a propitiation for the wrath of the army of the Philistines so that if he succeeded, the glory, the honor, the victory would be imputed to the nation of Israel, okay? If he failed, if he died, the loss would be imputed to the nation of Israel, okay? Jesus is saying, don't you understand? This is me. This is Christ, okay? The overwhelming force of darkness is sin, is death. And I'm standing here in the gap, and I'm saying, if I win this one, okay, if I am resurrected, then my victory, my life, my purity is imputed to everyone who believes in me. And, 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 and the more that he talks through the scriptures, the more he explains the scriptures with this hermeneutic key to these guys, the more their hearts are quickened and lit up on fire. Okay? Because when we begin to see that, the story behind the story, the pattern of God's redemption just the golden thread running through every word of the Gospels, every word of the Old Testament, that is when our hearts get excited. Yes, God is doing a work. He started it from the very start. He knew what he was going to do. He knew what was coming. Okay, so we need this. We need this. And, and, and the key to access it, one of the keys to accessing it, is the Word of God. Okay, it's so fundamentally important. I've got on a roll here and missed all of my words. So their hearts are set on fire. And Luke wants our hearts to be on set on fire too. All right? We can do that. We can access that through the scriptures. Okay, finally. What is it? Oh, crumbs. I better hurry up. <laughs> the relationship of the resurrection. All right, this is the final bit. Um, Jesus was walking with men who knew him in his pre-resurrection body and they did not recognize him okay that is a message to us jesus can be in your life in many ways and you can be blind to it all right and maybe before you came to faith you had an experience that subsequently you look back on and said i think that was jesus i think he was walking with me then Okay, so that, that's, that's the experience that God wants to have of him. Okay? We can be, he can, even in troubles, that can be Christ walking with us. All right? And we can come to him saying, oh, life makes no sense. All the promises of God have come to nothing. Jesus is right there. He's walking alongside you. Why can't we see him? Well, he's extraordinarily ordinary. Okay? The resurrected body of Christ 
in the Bible, there are other resurrections, Lazarus and a few others, okay? They weren't resurrected into resurrection bodies, okay? They were kind of reanimated into their human bodies. So they had to die again, okay? Jesus is walking in his resurrection body, all right? How would you expect a resurrection body to look? Super buff, yeah? Shining with light, you know? Maybe, maybe hovering a little bit along the floor. <laughs> no, you know, this isn't the God that we know, all right? He has created a resurrection body that is so recognizable that it can go unnoticed, okay? The relationship we have with God is, is going to be recognizable as the one that we have on, with each other here on this earth, okay? It's not this esoteric, you know, mad thing with explosions and light. It's, it's this, it's community, it's fellowship. It's reflected in the body of Christ as we see it now. You know, it will be better. No, of course it will. You know, but it's not going to be this profound change. And, 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 it, and it reflects also God's work in our lives, okay? He walks with us, all right? He doesn't act with explosions and bright lights, okay? Sometimes we get a bit scared. Oh, God's not done anything in my life recently. I've not been knocked down to the ground, you know, unwillingly i've not had a blinding light flash me in the eyes how can it be real okay that's not how god chooses to work for the 99 of us it's a walk it's a slow walk every day one step closer with god walking walking with him okay this is we're in trouble here i've started to jump ahead (laughs) don't wait for fireworks don't expect the dramatic okay we love to get testimonies of the front of people whose lives have been like completely changed. Oh, I was on heroin. You know, God came and hit me like a car crash. That we love hearing those because they fill us with faith. But most of the time, it's, it's, it's a slow thing, isn't it? It's a slow transition. And one day we look back and we say, gosh, Christ was walking with me and all of that. Isn't that amazing? So let's hold on to that. <coughs> um, I just, I don't, I, I, if I start on this next bit, we'll be here for an hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, right, I'll just finish with this. The action of walking um, is pr- a profound metaphor from the Bible. You know, he walked with Abraham, he walked with the Israelites, he walked in Leviticus. We want to walk with Christ, okay? What is walking? It's slow, it's intentional, it builds relationship, okay? God doesn't ask us to somersault. He doesn't ask us to run, all right? It's not sustainable to do that thing, okay? God calls us into a a sustainable relationship with him where we walk with him day by day. We are in companionship with him, okay? We have the tangible presence of God sometimes in our hearts, but each day as we walk with him, we know who we are, we know who he is, and we know we are fully known by him, okay? How does that change our lives? We walk with integrity, okay? We're not different in different relationships, different circumstances, because we are always walking as someone who's walking with Christ. All right, we're fully loved, we're fully known, okay? We can talk to him and know we've been heard. We can hear him and know it is from him, you know? And we can have that proper engagement and relationship, Okay, um, email is fine, text is fine, Zoom is bad, but a walk with a friend, it's so much more tangible, isn't it? <coughs> so that's what our walk with Christ is. It's a day in, day out, continuous, mindful decision to walk with him, to talk with him, to understand that all of life is understood best through him, 